Hi everyone, today we're going to be texturing the sci-fi corridor made in the previous Freepart tutorial series. We're going to be making use of a variety of software, some is paid but most is free, primarily Blender and Unity with a small amount of 3D Coat and Substance Designer. Just to show you what we're working towards, here's a short clip of the result from the end of the series. To start this though, we're going to have to have a discussion about what texturing is and how the way we texture content will vary depending on our working environment. Now, if you are new to 3D art, you probably know that to give your objects textures, first of all you need a pretty model, then you need to do something that seems overly confusing called UV mapping, and then you need a collection of textures to wrap around that object. At its simplest form, yes, that is generally true across the board, but there's a few more things that people don't often talk about in tutorials about texturing content, and that's what we're going to be doing here. So point number one is that it completely depends on your software environment and what result you are looking for. Now, most 3D software has functionality for displaying textures on a mapped object, but that's not the end of the road for most workflows nowadays. With things like Allegorhythmic Substance Designer, people are exploring the potential of procedural and dynamically changing texture systems. Unfortunately, to make use of all the features that substances provide, the software you are using must be able to interpret them. Not all softwares do. This is largely down to licensing. Blender does not support packed substance files. So what you would have to do is export a result of your material from Substance Designer into a collection of texture files and use those as maps inside of Blender. Now someone might think, if I was just going to end up using normal texture files for my workflow anyway, then what would be the point of using something like Substance Designer? Well that's a good point, but the thing is, it would be beneficial to use it if the functionality it provides is necessary to help you create something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to make with traditional image editing software. And make no mistake, Substance Designer has an extreme powerful set of tools to help you design materials. It has even sparked a whole new wave of material artists who have a specific focus on the software. What this all implies though, is that for the rest of us multi-software content developers, there's generally a certain threshold of complexity that needs to be passed before deciding to use advanced texture creation tools as opposed to traditional image editing software. So let's think about this. Unity does support packed substance files, and they have done for quite a while because Unity and Allegorhythmic have worked together to get the functionality going. However, the textures that I personally want to make for my environment are simple and quite easy to make with traditional image editing software. What this means for my workflow is that I'm probably not going to get an extensive use out of Substance Designer, although for the sake of demonstration, I might make use of it to construct myself some extra texture variations. You will see this in the next video, where I use basic nodes in Substance Designer to create placeholder textures for my environment while I am UV mapping the content. Now we are going to talk about texture painting. To give artists much more control over how to texture their model, many softwares come with functionality that lets users paint directly onto their model, but each seems to have a slightly different way about it. Ideally, for texture painting, an artist would want a toolset much like Photoshop that just happens to work in three dimensions, with some extra features for masking, symmetry, dynamic resolution, and so on. Although most texture painting solutions provide this kind of toolset to some degree, this isn't always the case. The way you paint with them will change due to differences in design. Some softwares like Substance Painter and Quixel Suite put an emphasis on layer masking and color ID mapping, whereas softwares like 3D Coat are much more freeform and put an emphasis on making use of creative conditional brush tools, although this all depends on how the user prefers to use each of the softwares. Just to demonstrate, one thing that I love about 3D Coat is the ability to choose to only paint in concave or convex areas without having to first isolate those areas in some kind of mask. It's very intuitive and it literally feels like Photoshop in 3D. More painting freedom and less technical overhead. The thing is, because texturing is a messy field, there's no concrete standardization in ways to do things. This is both a good and a bad thing. 3D Coat has its own smart material system that lets you blend different textures together whilst giving you control over edge scattering and cavity effects. For each of them, you can change physical properties and even modulate the color on them. It's quite a powerful set of options, however, I would like to see better organization for the material library, preferably a nested folder layout. Actually, that's my gripe with Substance Painter too. Developers take note, more nested folders. There's also a system called PTEX, per face texturing, which is a solution developed by Walt Disney Animation Studios. Essentially, it's a way to texture objects without UV mapping them by applying a texture to each face of the object, but you won't find this widely supported in game engines. The lowest common denominator in all of this then is a collection of texture files. 
So as long as we find our way to getting the files we want, then it doesn't matter what softwares we use, right? Well, this is where a lot of people would stop and say, yep, that's all you need to know. But there's still a lot more we need to talk about. Now we're going to move on to point two. You don't always need texture files in brackets procedural. What well, if I told you, you might never have to make a single texture file ever and still get the results you are looking for. This is where we start leaving the field of texture artistry and start moving into technical design. Take a look at this Sphinx. It was made by Zacharias Reinhardt. It's fantastic, isn't it? It has a beautiful set of textures, right? Well, wrong. There are no textures here other than internally generated noise textures. This cat has been completely procedurally textured through the power of material nodes. Well, how you ask? Because art is data in the digital world. And just as you can turn art into data, you can also turn data into art if you know how. Zacharias has been doing some awesome experimentation in the field of procedural texturing, specifically in relation to Blender. This isn't exactly what his original file looked like, because I've played around with the lighting and nodes a bit, but I'll leave a link in the description where you can go and see how he did this for yourself. The general process is to use nodes to generate textures, decide how to map them around an object, and perform some mathematical operations to give us some extra control over how the nodes interact with each other. The results of our node graph get pushed to an output which becomes what we see rendered. The benefit of using procedural materials this way is that we don't need to UV map the object. Anyway, the reason I'm showing you this is to make the point that depending on your working environment, you might never need to UV map, texture your object manually, or paint it at all. When constructing procedural materials with nodes, what we are actually doing is constructing shaders. Shaders are a whole beast of a subject by themselves, so we're just lightly skimming over the surface of them with the context of texturing. We'll come back to shaders in a moment. Point number three, recycle materials and plan where they will go on your models. You might have noticed if you watched the previous tutorial series that I began planning out where I would want different materials to go on my objects. I mentioned briefly that I had allocated about three placeholder materials in Unity with different shades and reflectivity to give myself a guide of how I wanted the scene to look in the end. The smaller the details, the darker the material. Some of the objects made use of only one of the materials and other objects made use of all of them. This is because I was assigning material references to different parts of the mesh in Blender, which is quite easy to do. These material references were preserved in Unity, so it was easy to maintain the visualization. What I do quite a lot in my work is only use a small collection of materials and create varieties of them through material instances, then assign these materials to different material slots on the objects. This means that I quite often don't use other software to texture paint my objects, although for some more detailed props, I do go ahead and give them some extra attention, as you will see in the next video. Now, there are many reasons why I use this material hot swap workflow. I am quite interested in random generation and proceduralism, so I like to make things as interchangeable as possible. Now not everyone's workflow will be like this, so when it comes to making your own content, you need to think about what you want and what workflow you want to use to achieve it. Now some dedicated texture artists out there might look at my hot swap workflow and go, well, that's not great because you're limiting the amount of detail you can give to each specific object. What about if you wanted to add some edge wear or putting dirt in crevices of individual objects? And to that I say, it's time to revisit shaders. So, point number four. You don't have to paint the model if the details can be added through shaders. Strictly speaking, with shaders we can grab information about the world and mesh and use it to apply texture content to the surface in conditional ways. What I mean by this is that we can add dirt to crevices and edge wear to the sharp edges without having to paint them onto the object manually. Another example would be having a layer of snow or wetness present over the top of an object. When manually texture painting, we can only put these details in one place, but by using shaders we can have them always be present on the top of the object in relation to world space. Another benefit that shaders provide is the ability for our material instances to change results in real time. This means if we had set up our shader to change the level of dirt on an object in response to a numerical value, we could change that value while the game is running and watch the changes happen. Whereas if we just painted dirt on the base texture of our object, we wouldn't be able to change it. Another thing to mention about textures in relation to shaders is that they don't have to be just related to the surfaces of meshes. The reason there are so many types of texture maps in common workflows is because they describe how to render pixels to the screen. All the pixels in the texture files are is data. 
For example, we could use this texture input as a numerical input if we wanted to give our shader some virtual randomization. Well, it wouldn't really be random since it would be a static texture input, but then again, we could also generate a changing texture and use that as a data input in and of itself, such as with the Blender Sphinx example. We could create holograms and use a texture input to tell the shader where to make pixels glow in space. We could make some kind of particle swarm shader that uses a texture file to tell it where to congregate swarm objects. These are just a few examples. There are virtually no limits other than your own creativity. Now I'm not a shader artist as of yet, but I plan on doing some experimentation to build shaders for future projects. If I come up with anything useful, I will surely create some videos about it. In the context of Unity, two good solutions you could use to start building your own shaders is Unity's own shader graph, which you can get from the Unity 2018 package manager by going to Window, Package Manager, All, and then Shader Graph. An awesome and extremely powerful alternative is the Amplify Shader Editor, which is provided by Amplify Creations on the Asset Store. Unity's Shader Graph is free, but Amplify Shader Editor is paid. So if we can use shaders for this and it provides us with more control, then why would we ever want to paint a model? Because let's face it, shaders alone won't give you the Mona Lisa. Again, it depends on what you want your end result to be. If you are only ever painting your models to get dirt and crevices and provide some edge wear, then you might want to rethink your workflow because you might be able to save yourself a lot of time and storage space while also providing yourself with real-time control over the values. But then again, it depends on what you're comfortable with and what your pipeline allows. So all of these points that we've talked about are why texturing is a bit of a messy field, especially for newcomers. And the main point I want to get across is that the way I am going to be texturing my content is definitely not the only way to do it. Other people might tell you there's only one right way to do it, but that's just not how we work on my channel. Just remember, everything here is only data. There are a virtually limitless number of ways to turn X into Y. In the end, it doesn't really matter, as long as you end up with the result that you like. If my workflow inspires you to do the same, then that's cool. But if you like to use a completely different approach, then there's nothing wrong with that. Now, I think that should just about do it for this series primer. I know this one turned into a bit of a lecture, but one of my main priorities is letting you know how much freedom you have in making things. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell. So I'll see you in the next video, where we're going to start texturing our sci-fi corridor.